there are times when he does this open, open, close hi hat motif, and I love that sound so much. It's so great. Uh Everybody out there, welcome back to another episode of the Audio Files. I'm Andy, that's John, and we share music and discuss. That's kind of the whole gist. Uh, and today, John is going to be offering me up a song to go off and listen to, hopefully for your enjoyment and mine. Uh, but in order to do that, John, I'm going to need to know what you have. Okay, we're going back to a band that uh, you listened to a couple before, part of your... Um education into uk music the clash okay. um yeah so we have another one um this one is called brackets white man and brackets in hammersmith palais okay um, forgive my ignorance on this uh what is hammersmith palais it is a venue oh okay over there i assume in hammersmith no less, which yeah, is a uh, a part of London. Okay, it's a part of London. What a famous venue as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it used to be old school sort of um, places, theatres, and stuff like that, and, and these sort of venues used to be called things like palais. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, Camden. Yeah. I, I remember Camden Palais actually. What a shit hole that was, but fun, but fun. Anyway, didn't, didn't um, <laughs> look to the palais billing, did it? <laughs> no, <laughs> excellent. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah. Better than the Hippodrome, anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> you go off and listen to The Clash, come back and tell us what you think, and then I'll do the translations for you. Uh, yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Little sky action. For the first time from Jamaica, Ninja and Ali Rice Fart, the Ryan Wilson, the Kula Maria, Camp Food, the UK Pop Brigade, with back in fine sound system. If they got anything to say. So playful sounding. Nice. Yeah, I really love how it started off with kind of that one, two, oh, one, two, three, four, and just sort of like power chord driven motif. Thinking, okay, this is like punk, uh, or like punk, very punk adjacent rock, uh, and then it totally slips into this total like funhouse ska kind of almost circusy sound, which is so playful and fun to listen to. Great bass work in there. Love the kind of of the hi-hats uh at times uh during in the drum beat itself um yeah it's really really good i'm only uh, this is like my cross to bear as a as a yank listening to uh the the clash it's sometimes hard for me to grasp all the lyrical content that's being delivered um i'm catching bits and pieces of it and what i'm catching does sound interesting um 
I'm very sure at the end of this, I'm going to need John to fill out probably 70% of these lyrics for me, but I'm liking the sound I'm getting here. It actually has this more, I don't know, accessible feeling to it. Uh, almost a slightly more mature feeling than some of the grittier things I've heard from the clash. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, let's, let's continue on. This is, this has been a lot of fun. Some really like soft harmonies that are lovely uh, sounding. But perhaps something that I wasn't I wasn't expecting to get from a song by The Clash. Now, my knowledge of, you know, the, the depth and breadth of my knowledge of the, of the Clash's oeuvre is nowhere near what I'm sure some of y'all's are uh, or what John's is. Um, but that's, again, something that I didn't, wouldn't be one of the first things I would use to describe uh, my Clash listening experiences, but it sounds really good, airy and kind of fun. It, it, it complements this ska motif really well. Um, and also it changes a little bit from verse to verse, which breaks up what would otherwise be some like, like sameishness across the verses. So I, I'm really enjoying how they're able to inject freshness into each of these like stanzas or bits throughout the verses. Even the drums are like adding clicks, like they're switching the beat up a little bit and doing like a, like a rim click, uh, driven beat, which again is keeping things fresh and different from bit to bit. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that twangy wail of the guitar that's sort of introduced a little bit there is really nice. Beat falls back. There you go. Oh, I love that little flourish at the end, like in the breath in between. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that was a really fun listen. Uh, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. The Clash like regarded by endless amounts of people to be one of maybe like the top rock bands of all time. Um, so yeah, that shouldn't come as much surprise that I enjoyed this listen, but it was, it was a little bit different than perhaps what I was expecting. Um, whether that's fair or not, I don't know. But it, it was playful and interesting. And I caught, like, you know, there's allusions to wealth distribution and race and class uh, in this song, 
which I suppose that doesn't come as much as a surprise coming from the Clash. Uh, but it would it's going to be nice to have John kind of fill in these the lyrical content gaps that I clearly have going on here. But yeah, the song was really well crafted, fun. Um, it was intelligent how they kind of added bits and pieces and played with like uh, dynamics or new parts and shifting parts um, throughout the structure of this to keep it fresh um, and to be able to continue to tell this pretty uh, long narrative for The Clash. Like, it didn't seem like there was much in, in the way of, like, a chorus in this song. It just seemed like straight, almost stanza after stanza of, of verse um, that they're using to convey the, the lyrical kind of point to this to this tune. But yeah, no, this fun, playful, awesome rhythm section in this with all that, like, kind of that ska motif, which inherently relies on, you know, drums and bass to provide a bounce and movement. Um, and it had that in, in droves. So yeah, I really, yeah, I really like this one. I can't wait for John to kind of explain to me the... Uh, sort of the 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 backstory of this one and the and the lyrical content or intentions uh that Strummer had when he was penning this because yeah it's a the title alone is pretty of you know thought provoking so yeah let's get back to him and see what he has to say about it yeah I really enjoyed this yes you think not all he's back so you've had a listen to uh, the clash uh white man in Hammersmith Palais yes um what did you think? Um, well, uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. You weren't lying when you brought when you brought up or alluded to having to translate for me because uh, <laughs> such was my experience that I could easily rely on a translator. Uh, having listened to that, I caught bits and pieces. Um, and I got I got to be honest. When it comes to s strictly singing, I have a hard time with the really thick Cockney accent sometimes and picking up all of the lyrics. So uh, I do appreciate you offering your services and thank you for that. Um, yeah, the song starts the way I think in my head that every Clash song should start. One, two, one, two, three, four. Like just for some reason, that is the most British punk start to a song I've ever heard. And for some reason, I always equate that to a band like The Clash who is the quintessential sort of British punk band. Um, so that instantly brought a smile to my face. It Then it kicks off into this like fiery power chord driven progression for a bit there. Not very long, but it was also not the most, it was more punk than I guess some of the rest of the song, but it wasn't the most stripped back punk sound I've ever heard. So I'm thinking, all, all right, this is, I don't know. Um, it's either, it's at the very least is a, a divergence from my own, um, you know, predisposed feelings about what I think I'm going to get from the Clash from the very few songs that I've heard from them, which probably isn't wholly fair on my part, but it's just, you know, such as the lens of looking through something with any form of bias or presupposition. Uh, but that part ends with some, like, higher notes uh, being hit on the guitar before it shifts completely in tone and rhythm. And the verse kind of blossoms, if that's the word the verb I want to use here, into this, like, sort of ska rhythm um, and not even sort of like very ska, very much a ska rhythm uh, that like like most things ska has this playful tone and movement to it. It's ska is such a rhythm based subgenre, um, and the bass and the drums kill it in the song. I love it so yeah. much. It's very very playful. And after a couple stanzas of the of the verses, the song shifts into a more straightforward punk rock bit with the very like the very beginning. Uh, during which Strummer delivers the lines about, I think, the four tops, something about stage right, and something about bass and treble. Um, and I'm sorry, but that's as close as you're going to get to a verbatim, you know, <laughs> recanting of the of the lyrics because I, like I said, struggled a little bit here. And I, I wish I was able to catch more, but, you know, such is life uh, as a Yank listening to the most Cockney of Cockney accents and set to music. Uh, and then after an allusion to roots rock and rebel i think the song shifts back into full scottum and this under this is underscored by the guitar hitting those like chord flourishes 
um, that was super that behind the super fun beat on the drums. Uh, and like there are times when he does this open, open, close hi hat motif, and I love that sound so much. It's so great. Um, again. This is the word of the day, but playful. Uh, it's just so engaging and fun. And there's also this like fun house bass line uh, that's almost like a ska circus vibe. Uh, and I really, really like that as well. And there's some really nice, again, flies in the face of like my crude understanding of the clash, but like great harmonies. Uh, throughout this which is not something one goes oh yes punk rock the masters of vocal harmonization you know it's mostly just like barking you know beliefs into a microphone like strident beliefs over like really harsh guitar but no lovely lovely harmonies um multiple voices during this bit with uh lines about white youth and black youth that's what i can that's what i caught um, and at this point, I'm starting to feel like I'm I'm really on a roll here because I also caught the next line where he sings about finding a better solution, which is a weird word or phrase to hear whenever you're talking about race uh, post World War II. It's like, oh, uh, but I'm sure that there's some like meaning to it. Uh, uh, and maybe he's even kind of like having fun with that. Or maybe it's just my own psyche um, and what how I equate things. But this is fo then followed by why not phone up a Robin Hood and ask him for some wealth distribution, I believe, which b ticked a couple boxes for me. The Disney kid of, of my past, as well as the uh, the huge fan of Bernie Sanders, uh, a politician over here in the United States, who's often accused of wanting to propagate wealth distribution. So both of these boxes were checked for me, the Disney kid and the Bernie Sanders fan. So I enjoyed that bit. And then after this this portion, I think we get some like I think we get some interestingly placed sustained harmonica notes. Um, that sounds like that. Okay, good. Thank you for shaking your head because I was like a little bit wavery about that. I mean, it sounded like harmonica, but again, interesting choice for a punk slash ska song. Um, and at least you know that's that that's what. I thought I heard. So thank you again for the confirmation. Again, they begin playing around with harmonies and accompanying vocals as the verses progress. And I'm not sure what number verse this is because this song seems to be very much the song without a chorus. And like, we just have this use of verses and the stanzas therein to progress this narrative or story that's being told, uh, which is interesting and cool. And I like that. Um, and then there were treated to these, uh, airy almost dreamy ahs that are peppered in um every couple of lines uh sort of i guess that's between strummer's lines you're getting these like accompanying bandmates providing these ahs i thought that was pretty cool too uh interesting they're doing a really good job of like because this is so bass in its in its parts like it's again verse 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 they're doing a good job of of adding and injecting changes to vocal harmonies or beat the beat itself to kind of keep everything from sounding so goddamn homogenized the whole way through. So you're getting like these points of variance that keep the song fresh mm -hmm. and keep it from becoming this like, Oh my God, the slog that you're just waiting for something to change in. So um, yeah, all these little touches are great. Um, and it's, it's not just the vocal styles and the additives they're using uh, on, at, at, to, to this end. They also do things with the drums, as I alluded to, and I said the beat to keep things fresh. These, like, the switch to rim hits as the driving force of the beat rather than straight hits on the skins. That is a lot of fun. And honestly, rim hits with a very fun, you know, bass line, fun moving yeah, bass line with Scott just kind of go hand in hand anyway. So... I really enjoyed that. There's this line delivered uh, through seemingly stifled laughter only to be lyrically followed by the line. You think that's funny. And that just brought a smile to my face. That sort of, you know, ha ha ha. And then, you know, you think that's funny. If, well, yeah, actually I, I thought the whole packaging of that line and delivery was funny. Um, so around the two fifty five mark, the song gets fuller with more harmonies accompanying the vocals and the beat goes back into a driving straight beat rather than these rim hits. Um, and it's filling out a little bit more with sound, nothing crazy, but like you feel the shift in the song uh, and you feel it become a, a bit fuller. 
And this carries on with the lines about Adolf Hitler and a nod to the song's title, which I think is the first and only time I caught it. Um, then shifting back into that previous motif around the 328 mark. Uh, though now we're treated to some shots of wailing guitar here and there uh, before it ends on some great like strum flourishes that are separated by this odd breath, I assume by strummer that he kind of like injects in between the two of them. Um, and yeah, the song was fun and really well crafted. And from what I caught lyrically, there was some really interesting things being said here, though I didn't catch the whole gist of it. Um, so I imagine with a title like this, there are some serious underlying points and some poignant observations being made. I just failed to catch a lot of them. So I'm going to need you to fill me in. Um, but knowing what I know about the clash and sort of previous discussions, this has to be, you know, teetering on the line of discussing class. I don't even think you could say teetering on the line when you say disgusting race, when there's direct allusions and shit, it's in the title kind of. Um, so yeah, please tell me more about this interesting ska-like number. Oh, oh yes. off, also really quick, John, I think we all know that ska is sort of a derivative of reggae, right? Like it's sort of sprouted from reggae. Reggae is very much born of black experiences and, and it, it is a first and foremost or born of, you know, black folk. So it's interesting to have white men in a title that relies on a sound that was developed and sort of revolutionized by, you know, African-American or Caribbean folk of, you know, a darker pigmentation uh, than the guys in The Clash. So interesting point as well about the song, I think. Yeah, OK. So I picked this song because sort of common uh, acceptances, this is one of the very best Clash songs, one of their most important songs as well. It's one of their most beloved songs. And for a lot of people, it will be their favourite Clash song. And for a number of people, it will be their favourite song of all time. I mean, it's really up there. So this was originally, um, I believe it was intended to be put out on their second album, Given Enough Rope, that we said for European Home you listened to from. Um, but instead, it was released in between the albums as a standalone single. In June 1978. So we've done some Clash um, songs already and episodes. I think there's a playlist. If there isn't, there is now. Um, and this will be added to it. Um, so won't go over all the backgrounds and all that sort of stuff. But just to remind anyone who doesn't know, Joe Strummer, lead vocals, piano, guitar. Mick Jones, backing vocals, lead guitar, harmonica. Paul Simonon, bass, guitar, and top of head drums um so yeah it was this was released in between their self-titled debut album which is punk no doubt and then given off road which is post-punk so the song along with had this live this real nice period in between the two albums where they released some singles um complete control that you listen to clash city rockers and this one that makes a real real jump up in terms of their maturity of songwriting and their musical approach as well from this which is a great album but is a very limited in terms of yeah. the punk sound you you can, um, you can you can hear i mean that is palpable everything you just said sort of the yeah. growth in the, of the music writing experience and their maturity there and like yeah i felt that it's bundled on with this album because when this album was uh re-released in america it was all sorts of jiggery pokery went on and they whacked in extra tracks of which this was one of them Okay. So for the American market, this is seen as being part of this album. Yeah. Well, it's not. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, compared to their earlier singles, this is more in line with um, Police and Thieves, which you know they, they did um, a cover of, which is a reggae song. Um, so you've got this powerful guitar intro, which then, as you say, descends into this slow scar rhythm. And it was kind of disorientating for a lot of fans who were used to that. Um, and uh, some quotes here from them. Um, so Mick Jones said, the music is a mixture of the reggae influence and punk and was the next step after Police and Thieves. And uh, Strummer said, we were a big fat riff group. We weren't supposed to be doing something like that. 
isn't this song? It immediately became a firm favourite of Clash fans. And in 1978, Enemies end of year readers poll, it was voted single of the year. Um, it was number seven in John Peel's um, Best of 50, which is a show he did at the end of the year where the fans all voted. The listeners, sorry, all voted in. Um, in 1978, in number seven, as I say. And there's another quote here from Alan McGee, who uh, who uh, ran Creation Records. He said, maybe the greatest record ever written by white men. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All Music wrote that White Men in Ham Hampshire Palais may actually have been the very first song to merge punk and reggae. Um, Consequence of Sound described it as one of Stroma's greatest lyrical compositions. And in 2004, Rolling Stone rated the song number 430 in its list of 500 greatest songs of all time. Um, in uh, 2003, um, you know, music magazine Uncut ranked the song number one in their list of best 30 Clash songs. Um, the list was chosen from a panel including former members, Terry Chimes, who played drums on this album and then probably left because it's all no future in the band. Um Mick Jones, the aforementioned and Boston as well. So yeah, just a note before I get into this, I've got the lyrics and then some notes on the lyrics. Um you mentioned a couple of things there. So the harmonies. This was a, a, a developing theme that sort of went through the clash of uh, Mick Jones sort of pop sentimentality, <laughs> if you want to call it that sensibility, sorry. Um and so you get these lovely harmonies, usually from him. Um, Joe Strummer wasn't averse to barking, and I think he's continued to bark to the end of his career, really, at various sort of degrees of barking. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was the sort of interesting uh, bit, and I think created some tension as well between between the two members. But that creative tension probably helped for a while as well. Um, and it wasn't just straight pop, you know, he had a little twist on it, but he, you know, loved doing things like that, and you'd see from... Uh, from all these other band, Big Audio Dynamite, etc. So, yeah, just as a side note, the single, which Lord has just said, has reached number 32 in the US, the UK charts. So, yeah. So, lyrics. I'll go through them, and then I'll try and explain various bits, which you have no chance of picking up anyway. Um, one, two. Oh, one, two, three, four. Midnight to six, man. For the first time from Jamaica. Dillinger and Leroy Smart. Delroy, Riz Delroy Wilson, your cool operator. Ken Booth, the UK pop reggae, with backing bands, sound systems. And if they've got anything to say, there's many black ears here to listen. But it was four tops all night, with encores from stage right, charging from the bass knives to the treble. But on stage, they ain't got no roots, rock rebel. On stage, they ain't got no roots, rock rebel. Jump. Uh, dress back, jump back. This is a blue beat attack. Because it won't get you anywhere, falling with your guns. The British Army is waiting out there, and it weighs 1,500 tonnes. White youth, black youth, better find another solution. Why not phone up Robin Hood and ask him for some wealth distribution? And then my notes, harmonica and bass, doing their little dance. Punk rockers in the UK, they won't notice anything. They're all too busy fighting for a good place under the lighting. The new groups are not concerned with what there is to be learned. They got Burton suits. Ha, you think that's funny? Turning rebellion into money. All over people changing their votes along with our overcoats. If Adolf Hitler flew in today, they send a lim limousine anyway. I am the all night drug prowling wolf who looks so sick in the sun. I'm the white man in the palais, just uh, looking for fun. Only looking for fun. Oh, please, mister, just leave me alone. I'm only looking for fun. So interesting stuff. Um, OK, let me bring up my, whoops, let me bring up my notes. And I'll go through it and try and explain various references and things like that he's got in it. So um, this, this was actually based on... Well, the first part of it is based on a real event. The show he attended was an all-nighter featuring reggae bands from Jamaica and uh, an act called uh, Matumbi from London. Um, so you have, you list some, some of the artists. So you got Dillinger, um, 
He was born Lester Bullock, a Jamaican reggae artist, and his best known 1976 hit, Cocaine in My Brain, was a Jamaican toasting style, which kind of laid the groundwork for American rap and hip hop. Um, uh, Leroy Smart was a roots rock reggae artist, best known for his 1976 song, Ballistic Affair. And uh, Delroy Reeson was a reggae artist who was dubbed Cool Operator for his smooth Motown soul vocals. Um, Ken Booth, another one he mentions, he found big success in the UK charts. Um, he specialised in a very sort of homogenised type of uh, music that Strummer referred to as pop reggae. I don't think he was very fond of it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and he was saying, if they've got anything to say, there's many black ears here to listen. So, Strummer was kind of anticipating this probably a social political event, sort of first sort of all night of you know black reggae music, and it wasn't. Um, and he's kind of inferring that people. I mean, this is this is the notes I I grabbed from Genius actually, and so this guy's got some interesting things to say. I don't always agree with what he says, but it's interesting takes. He says the people who listen to reggae generally pay more attention to the lyrical content and the song's general meaning compared to those at punk shows during this era who were more into the subculture and the instrumentation that, rather than the lyrics. I think that's just a matter that you quite often couldn't hear or understand the lyrics in punk songs. And um, reggae tunes sort of lend themselves to be a bit more gentle and easier to usually understand, unless it's in a strong patois. Um, so he mentions Bluebeat. Bluebeat Records was an English record label that released Jamaican R&B and ska music in the 60s. Its reputation led to the use of the word Bluebeat as a generic term to to describe all sorts of early Jamaican um, pop music. Um, okay, so, scrolling down my notes. Um, yeah, so he goes on about the British Army, which is fairly self-evident, and then this um, white youth, black youth, but if I had a solution, phone up Robin Hood asking for wealth distribution. So kind of what he's saying here is, you know, these disaffected youths of all races, the best way to affect social change is action. Um, rather than wishing some mythical hero, Disney or otherwise, to come along and affect change, because it ain't going to happen. Um, and then here's the really interesting stuff. So punk rockers in the UK, because he moves away from the from the concert now at this point, and it says punk rockers in the UK, they won't notice anything, they're all too busy fighting for a good place under the lighting. And then the next verse as well. So he's basically accused all the, the, the other punk bands of being uh, forgetting forgetting their original purpose, which he's decided what their purpose is. People form bands for all sorts of reasons, but in Strummer's mind, it was all to um, you know purpose of social change and of you know justice and rebellion. And instead, these guys are sniffing around for fame and attention and notoriety from the same estab very establishment which they should be rebelling against. Um, and the next line about they've got Burton suits, you think that's money turning rebellion into money. Burton's is a high street, um, uh, UK high street clothing retailer, pretty much a, a men's shop. Um, and it's that kind of 18 to 30, 35 range. Um, Burton suits were the suits worn by the jam at the time of the song. Um, and P Paul Weller picked them specifically to make them stand out from the rest of the punk bands that were basically in ripped jeans and denim. Yeah. Um, so interesting point there made by Strummer. Mm. Um, God's fired. Like will. Yeah. Um, it says all over the pe all over people are changing their votes along with their overcoats. The overcoats is an analogy for um people's social class. So now we're at the politics and the race, now we're into the social you know, class system. Yeah. So um he's saying about people changing their um political views as they climb the socioeconomic ladder abandoning their previously held convictions in, in favour of self-interest, which happens time and time again yep. all over the world, not just the UK. Um, and then he's saying if Adolf Hitler flew in, they send him a limousine. Um, he's not referring to any sort of point in particular. It's just um, a reference to the political climate at the time. Late 70s, there was a very hard swing to the right the UK was taking. Um Strummer would have seen Thatcher and Hitler as two sides of the same coin, basically. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then again, the song moves again into the I'm the All Night Drug Prowling Wolf Who Looks Sick in the Sun and the White Man Hamlet, uh, Palais Looking for Some Fun. So the notes here are really funny. At this point, the song, uh, in the song, things begin to turn and we start to get the idea 
that our narrator might just be talking out of his ass. He stays up all night at clubs, partying and doing drugs, so much so that he looks pale and sickly in the light of day. Um, and it says, um, Strummer pokes a little fun at himself and in turn lines the mood a bit from the previous heavy verses. He's kind of saying, but what do I know? I'm just looking for a good time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it is. Um, I quite like those notes, but you may not agree completely with them, but, yeah, it's quite thought out. So the concert that inspired the song's lyrics was an all-night reggae showcase uh, on the 5th of June, 1977, which is attended by Strummer, um, Don Letts, um, friend of the band, and Steve Connolly, who was a roadie, who was fashioning nicknamed Rodent. Um, I've got a copy of the poster, which I will insert in the edit. So, yeah, just to finish off and tie bow in this, this song was one of Joe Strummer's favourites. I think it's quite a nice balance He's in all the sort of message stuff he tries to get across and fun as well. He continued to play it live with his um, new band, the uh, Mescaleros, and it was also played at Joe Strummer's funeral as one of the songs. So there you go. Um, personally... It's not one of my favourite Clash songs. I really like it, don't get me wrong, but it's it's probably not in my top three. It's in my top ten. But, you know, everyone has their um, their views. So I'll wait to hear the messages on that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's it's one of their important songs in terms of their development. So it's yeah. Really definitely here. It's, it's you filling in the gaps for me and, and me understanding uh, a, yeah. a clearer picture of what the lyrical content was about and how much he was able to fit in with all of these different kind of, you know, yeah. whether it's recollections from, uh, an, you know, an actual concert that he attended um, and his feelings thereof or his contemporaries or the way the country was going in general, um, all yeah. of that to fit into this narrative um, in a very clever way is, is really interesting and, and fun to listen to. It, it was it made me enjoy it even more. Uh, after you've kind of helped yeah. like fill in some of those gaps for me, so yeah, this is this is really cool. I, it's it's excellent uh, lyricism. Now, I mean, it went from I think this is good. Once I get a better understanding, <laughs> yeah. of it, uh, but now it's like yeah, yeah, no, it, it's exactly what I thought it would be. It's that this early, and I'll call this still the early period of Clash. The first two albums, perhaps um, three, maybe I don't know. Um, there, there's a really nice, interesting mixture of intelligence um this sort of knowingness craft but also this earnestness which can be a bit sort of too much sometimes you know you've got to do this and this is the right thing to do sort of thing which um other people cynically would not have had you know in the clash i think probably did lose that later on but at the time they were still rocking the the flag for rebellion um he, he kind of blunts he kind of blunts that earnestness with the um self-awareness at the end yeah. that you alluded yeah, to yeah, right? yeah. which is no, which exactly. is great it's an excellent disarming mechanism yeah. uh to deploy especially in a song that earlier saw you making fun of like what was probably one of their competitor is a strong term but like another band vying for attention and money and sales not that that's what you know the clash was about but that's what attention equals dollars, right? And the jam was yeah. probably competing with them for that. And he's like, hey, you know, uh, I'm going to take my shot. But just so you know, it's not bad blood. Here at the end, I'm going to kind of make fun of myself a little bit too. And it makes him seem less pretentious or, you know, like like he's on a high horse if he's able to take the piss out of himself a little bit too. Um, yeah. A great disarming mechanism that a lot of people use in public speaking and and things like that. So it's, it's fun to see him. Uh, inject that as well as making some really strident and good points leading up to it right so yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Good, that's good songwriting man yeah, it is it is um yeah yeah you gotta take your hat off to strummer really good i mean um credit is um for the song is strummer and jones and i guess musically and lyrically that's how it would fit it mm -hmm. um but so uh, yeah Great stuff all around. They're a great band, as you've uh, have already mentioned. The the bass and drums should not be slept on. And mm. Top of Heaven was really, really good drummer. Really good drummer. Um, cool. All right, I shall wrap things up. Thanks for listening to this, Andy. Thank you. Folks out there, tell us what you think. Um, I imagine a lot of people looking at this video already know the song. If you haven't, well, 
Isn't this great shape for you? But um, for those who have, what do you think of this song? Where is it in your sort of hierarchy of Clash songs? Um, uh, yeah, tell us what you think. We'd love to hear your comments. Um, if you like this, please do hit the like button. Uh, and if you haven't already subscribed, welcome aboard um, the Order Files train. Stopping at Stevenage, Peterborough and Edinburgh. Um, <laughs> we'd love to have everyone on board and really appreciate everybody who does support the channel. Um, that being said, thanks again so much for watching. And we'll see all of you in the next episode of The Audio Files. See you later, guys. <laughs>